during World War II, I was a person aerial gunner and uh, then uh, uh, was able to get selected to go to navigation training. And I went to navigation training over in Monroe, Louisiana, which is nearby here. And uh, my brother, who was two and a half years older than I, he was a B-24 pilot flying out of England. And I was about to graduate and he got a hold of me by, or he wrote me a letter and he said, uh, yeah, they'll give you a preference uh, choice of airplanes. He says, they, they'll be honored if they can, but ask for B-17s, he said, because B-17s have a better combat record than any other airplane. Now, that's just kind of amazing because he was flying B-24s. And uh, I, of course, did just exactly. Incidentally, he later went missing in action and was declared dead. Uh, but he, uh, it, it touted me on to the B-17. I asked for it. They, they honored it. They uh, trained it uh, in Florida. Uh, joined a crew there. We went to Savannah, Georgia, picked up a brand new B-17, went to Newfoundland, and then flew across the Atlantic to the Azor Islands, North Africa, and Italy. Uh, turned our new, brand new airplane over to the de uh, depot there in Italy where they would uh, change it and fix it to conform to the requirements of the theater. And we went up to uh, the three or first bomb group in Poggia, Italy, and started flying missions bombing Germany and uh, southern, uh, southern Germany, uh, Austria, uh, Czechoslovakia. Uh, I flew 23 missions. Uh, the B-17 was completely uh, trustworthy. Uh, I lost some friends, but really and truly, and my brother's uh, prediction that it was a sturdy airplane proved 100% true. Uh, until the 23rd mission, we were uh, just leaving the IP to bomb the Lobau oil refineries, which were just outside of Vienna, and uh, we got hit. And the uh, pilot uh, hit the bailout button, and I bailed out at 31,500 feet and became a guest of the Germans for the rest of the war. I think this generation of Americans is meeting the challenges it has to meet. Now, there are, there are some that we would say don't meet the challenges, but that's true of every group. Uh, they, they don't all, uh, uh, not everybody, not everybody during World War II was eager to get into the fight, so that we had people using some very artful ways of avoiding it. But just like now, I think every generation meets the challenges in every American generation anyhow. Here's a, me as an enlisted gunner. Uh, I was uh, 18 years old and then I went to navigation training and became a second lieutenant. Uh, then uh, Eric on a crew, here's a picture of my, wait a minute, I can get it. Uh, there's a picture of my crew. And we were we were a fairly religious lot. Here's a picture of the same mass, except that it's got me identified. I was in the back row. I guess I was came in late or something. Uh, I uh, got shot down on that 23rd mission. And I became a prisoner of war. And after uh, I uh, was in the prison camp, and they marched us out at the end of the war, uh, I. Uh, uh, escaped from the line of march and eventually met, met up with the American forces. And uh, here's a picture that the American forces took of me. They were spearheading and they had no, uh, they had no uh, connection with the rear and so they had to take me up with them. And then when, when it came time that they could send me back, I stayed with them because it was almost, the war was almost over. All of our navigation uh, was by uh, calculators of this nature. This is a, a, the one I use, and uh, it, uh, it's computer air navigation dead reckoning. It's uh, the way we did, we use wind vectors and we did our uh, uh, navigation. Uh, that and celestial was the way we operated. No GPS, but we had to watch our we had to maintain the rate on our watches very carefully. Four seconds off in a celestial fix 
can make you a mile off on the ground. So you had to be very careful. You know, basically what uh, they'd been doing ever since the uh, 16th and 17th century, refined, but still all basically the same. Today's uh, navigators also have to have learned, have to learn all those older systems because they're not dependent upon anything else, satellites or anything, and they, they have to ha know how to do it from a backup. But in the, in the days that I was flying, uh, we, we had to do it just to get there. No calculators, these were our computers. Our airplanes were not, uh, the B-17 was not pressurized. We had to wear oxygen masks. Here's an oxygen mask that we wore uh, continuously in, in the in the B-17s. We we had carried sidearms, uh, never did get to use it, and we had a we carried knives. This is this is one that I had in my boot, and th they were practical because you you could uh, use them to cut your parachute shroud lines if you got tangled up. And then the other thing that uh, out of my archives was is the a, a notification uh, that I was uh, gone missing in action and then my uh, name has been found on the prison camp rolls although they hadn't found me yet and then finally uh, uh, I noticed that I had reported in down in Italy. The exciting thing about my bailout was that uh, you were instructed that if you have to jump out of an airplane uh, at altitude Number one, you don't open your parachute. You wait till you get down to a lower altitude for three reasons. First reason is that you're going faster in the rarefied atmosphere at the altitude. You're going faster than terminal velocity, and so you, you should wait till you slow down to have less shock to your chute. Secondly, if you, drop, if you don't open your chute, you get out of the zone of uh, flak much quicker. And third, you get down to where, and most important, where oxygen is. Uh, uh, well, I bailed out and I panicked and I pulled the ripcord right away. As soon as I saw the tail of the B-17 go by, I pulled the ripcord. I, the opening shock was pretty, pretty pronounced. I uh, ripped six holes in my chute and uh, I lost six sections of the chute. Two of them were right alongside of each other and I sat there and watched them rip slowly over to the seam. And I really, really, quite frankly, I'm not gilding the lily one bit when I say I figured I was dead. All of a sudden I heard a dog barking and I thought, geez, this thing will hold together just for a couple more moments. And then wham, I hit the plowed field and the plowed field it was muddy. I must have sunk, I don't know exactly, but I bet I sank six or seven inches, maybe a foot or so into the mud. Just before I was uh, landed, before I hit ground, I saw a whole group of people running in my direction. They arrived after a few moments, uh, so minutes I should say, maybe several minutes not, rather than a few moments. And one of them was in uniform, well, there was about three in uniform, the rest were civilians. And he got up to me and he said, where's your parachute? That was the first question he asked me. And I indicated about where it was and everybody took off. They were out there not after to capture me, they were out there to get the silk of the parachute, <laughs> which was some kind of amazing to me. They came back, one of them kept a gun on me, loaded me up and took me into, the, into a camp. And we were deployed uh, uh, two days. Two days after the war started, we were ordered to Japan. And we were at Langley Field, Virginia. After I flew 64 missions in B-26s and RB-26s out there in Korea, it was quite an interesting assignment. The airplane was a B-17, a modified B-17. So I got to fly in a B-17, not only in the Korea, Vietnam War, I mean not Vietnam, not only in the uh, World War II, but in the Korean War as well. I think some B-17s were used as air sea rescue with a boat slung underneath the uh, airplane. And I, I know that they were used in long range transport for quite a while after World War II. We had one in Berlin where I was stationed after World War II. And we made a couple, I made three crossings of the Atlantic in a, a B-17 out, out of Berlin. 
going uh, going uh, west to east with prevailing winds, you'd do it in eight nine hours. Uh, sometimes a little less. Coming back, you could go as high as thirteen hours because the, the winds blow consistently from west to east. I I was a guest speaker down at the Armed Forces Staff College, and we were at a, a hard stand way out in the boonies on the on the naval base, and the the only vehicle that was there was a. Uh, Fire truck that they, that they have to be, when an airplane lands, especially when it was so remote. People had not arranged for transportation for this guest speaker to get to the college. Uh, Do you know where the Armed Forces Staff College is? And he said, Sure, it's right across the street from our firehouse. I said, Well, you give me a lift over there? And he said, Sure. He said, Get in the cab. I said, No, I want to hang on the side. So I hung on the side of this fire truck. So the next day, and he was really surprised when his guest speaker arrived hanging on the fire truck. The next day, he sent his aide up to Washington. It says, uh, presented to Lieutenant General Howard Fish, the only guest speaker ever to arrive at the Armed Forces Staff College on, uh, by fire truck. Uh, we admire your style and class, Jeremiah Denton. And <laughs> What's unique about it, to my notion, it's, I had several, but this is the only one I kept. Look at how they, they had youngsters. They had 15-year-olds. This, this is a child's uh, helmet. This is World War I helmet, and this is a war of the Germans and the French in 1870. Just souvenirs.